what we're going to do today is, uh, first of all, it, you might notice me going and clicking on this machine here. Uh, I record my classes. Uh, a few disclaimers about the, uh, recording the class is, you know, I'm sort of, you know, limited by the ability of the camera to record. So it's not like you're getting, um, you know, IMAX quality video on these, you know. So you're getting... You know, you get what you get with this, and my, my thought is that um, it is uh, at least a way for you to get some of the material if you have missed a class or if there's something you need to review that we've discussed in class. So I think it's worthwhile even if the, the quality of the video isn't, isn't excellent. The one thing I will note uh, is that I upload all the examples that we cover in class. So probably the most common complaint is that when I start showing code, it's hard to read the code. And I definitely can sympathize about that. But by uploading it, at least you can see the final version. So that might help clear up some of the issues that you might have, that, that you, can, you can download the code and look at it as I'm talking about it. All right? Um, so again, consider that. I don't consider watching the videos a substitute for coming to class, but I do consider it uh, Better than nothing if you have to miss a class or if you want to go back and review uh, an explanation of, of something. All right. Um, let's see. Took attendance. What we're going to do today is go over just how Canvas is structured to give an overview of the class. Then we're going to talk about... Um, what are we going to talk about? One of us should know, right? Uh, we're going to... We're going to uh, give an overview of the class uh, from the perspective of like how the class is going to be run. Then we're going to give, uh, on, on grand terms, an overview of the material of the class. Talk about like what we are going to do. You know, not all in the first week, but what we're going to do throughout the entire semester uh, as far as creating dynamic, database-driven websites. We'll close by discussing your first uh, homework assignment. All right, and we'll talk about using Visual Studio. Now, I imagine many of you have already used Visual Studio. Uh, is that correct? We're going to use it in a particular way to develop web pages. So even if you've used it, that's great. You know, you're familiar with it. But uh, notice how I am going to be using it because I'm using it in a way that makes for the most uh, straightforward transferring of files if you're going to work on it here versus working on it at home and so on. All right, so I'm not going to cover everything in Canvas because I know that you can read on your own. One point of clarification as far as the time of this class. This is a four credit hour class. So this class has, typically classes are 50 minute lectures, 50 minute labs. Um, so uh, I think on your schedule it actually shows it incorrectly. I think it shows it from 10.15 to uh, 11.15. The lecture actually goes from 10.15 till 11.30. So we have an hour 15 minutes of lecture. The lab starts immediately following at 11.30 and goes to 12.20. So that's sort of the duration of the class. All right? Okay. I assume that you're all familiar with the mechanics of Canvas, so I won't really go over that in detail, other than to talk about how I use it in this particular class. I'm trying to figure out what... Oh, you can't see the recording. There's this thing on the bottom of the recording I'm trying to figure out what it is. What it's getting a picture of. Oh, well, not important. All right. When you log on, you'll come to, when you log on to this class, you'll come to the home screen, which shows you the modules for this class. There will be a module for each week, and that will contain any handouts that I have, as well as any materials I've prepared for you uh, there, there is no textbook for this class, correct? All right, yeah, which 
is good and bad, right? I mean, it's good because it's cheaper and there's so much material that's available online. Um, it's bad because some students do benefit from a, uh, having a hard copy of a book. Let me mention something to you, though. Uh, a free service is available to students at Lorain County Community College is Safari Books Online. And I try to mention this to all my classes because, you know, it's very valuable not just in this class but any IT-related class that you uh, might be taking. Let me show you how you get into it. And I'm first going to talk about how you get into it if you're here on campus. If you're here on campus, if you go to LC's website, search for library, or click a link for library, or, or you know, if you know, or if you bookmark the address or whatever. Um, if you go under databases, right here is Safari Books Online. And what Safari Books Online is, is a service that LC subscribes to, which means that if you're on campus and you're connected to the campus network, you can access it without supplying any credentials because it knows that you're at Loring County Community College. So when I click this, it's not going to ask me for any login information. It's just automatically going to take me into the database because it knows that I'm at LC's network. If you were to try this at home, it will ask you for your library card number and name. And your library card number is not your student number. It's the number on the back of your library card. And it's like longer. It's like 14 digits long or something like that. All right, so you'll be asked for that, and then you can log on. But if you're on campus, you can click here, and you can see full text versions of 44,000 different books. All right, so if you are interested in ASP.net, you can search for ASP.net. It will give you help. You know, well, let's try ASP.net 3.5. Unleashed, and that will take you, oops, maybe, we can go down and find something for this. Um, I'll pick this one just for no good reason. And you can come and you can see, and this is full text versions of the site. Okay, so if you want a textbook, um, my suggestion would be to go here and search and find something, and if you want me to review it and let you know what I think of it, I'll be glad to. So here's ASP 3.5 Unleashed, ASP 4 Unleashed. Just looking at the topics here, this looks like a pretty good, this looks like a pretty good uh, book to use in this class. All right. It does get confusing because for every topic there are so many books almost that you become overwhelmed and you're not really sure what's good. But I would say the ASP for Unleashed is a good textbook if you want to use it. And you can view it online and you can just you know look for the topics that we're covering in class. I imagine the sequence that I'm going to go over the material is pretty similar to the, to the sequence that most textbooks would cover. Right? I'm not going to jump in at the end and start talking about the most complicated things. I'm going to talk about the building blocks and then build up to the more advanced things, which I imagine most textbooks would do as well. Okay. So each week has a module. And the module consists of materials that I found on the web All right, that talks about the topics. And your labs and some examples that I cover in class and the videos for the lectures will be put here as well so you'll see you'll see a little bit different 
I keep stuff around from previous years just in case I need them. You know, sometimes if I'm doing an example and I'm having a bad day and my example don't work, I might download last semester's example because I know it worked, all right, and, and view that. All right. At any rate, there's a fair use guide handout, and this relates to using specifically images for most of the web classes that you find on the web uh, that are copyrighted. You know, you can't just take images off of the internet and use them on your web page. I know people do it, all right? But that SpongeBob meme that you posted to Facebook is probably, strictly speaking, a copyright violation, all right? No one's going to prosecute you, probably, all right? But, strictly speaking, you're violating someone's intellectual property by having an image that, that doesn't belong to you. This talks about what you need to do for homework assignments. This is not dealing with the commercial world or the business world, but for homework assignments, what you need to do. And in a nutshell, you're free to take a certain number of images off of a website as long as you give credit to that website. So some of the, some of the uh, assignments that you have, uh, you get to pick the topic. Some of the assignments the topic is given. So if I say pick a topic and you decide to do it about the Cleveland Browns, well, you could go to the Cleveland Browns website and take some, web, some images and use them on your page or site uh, as long as you give credit to the source of those images. This is an overview of client and server-side scripting, which is I'm going to spend a lot of time going over today. And this is a ASP.NET overview, which we might get into today or we might get into on Thursday. And then finally, here's your lab assignment that we'll talk about uh, at the end of the, uh, towards the end of the lecture. Um, there are announcements. I would urge you, there are no announcements at the moment, but I would urge you to check the announcements periodically, just in case I post something. I will post corrections of stuff that I did in class that wasn't correct, all right, if I, if I misspeak or if my example doesn't work. Um, sometimes, you know, for whatever reason, you know, um, I'm overlooking some obvious problem, you know, a typo, I forgot a semicolon or something, you know, the typical sorts of things that people do, all right? I'll post a correction after class. Um, I might post announcements uh, if people seem to be having the same question, if my instructions about what a lab assignment is isn't clear. You know, if two or three people ask the same question and I think, wow, that is a good question, I might post the answer to that just in case other people have that question. Or I might post things like if I know I'm going to be sick on a particular day, you know, and I'm not going to be in class. So you probably want to check the announcements periodically between classes. So maybe check it sometimes Wednesday or early Thursday morning, and then check it sometime over the weekend before the Tuesday class. Um, there are discussions where you can post stuff um, if you have questions that you think will benefit the rest of the class. All right. Okay, let's look at the syllabus. The syllabus, again, I'm not going to read verbatim to you. Um, I trust that you can read it, but I do want to hit sort of the high points and, and point out some things um, that are important as far as it goes. Uh, I have not announced my office hours yet. Um, I won't go into the details of the why, but this is going to be a very hectic semester for me. Um, and uh, I, I, I still have to decide what my office hours are going to be. That being said, if my office hours don't work for you, if I schedule my office hours and you're not available that day, there's a number of other things that you can do. All right? One of those th other things is you can come to any of my other labs. All right? So this class has a lecture and a lab. So. The lab time is your time to work on the homework assignments. Well, all my other classes, my three other campus-based classes, also have lab times, all right? And you're welcome to come to any of those times. Uh, I'll post the precise times, but essentially I have a class Monday and Wednesday mornings, Monday and Wednesday afternoons. This class is Tuesday and Thursday morning, and then I also have one early evening on Tuesdays and Thursdays. So that's another way 
you're invited to come to any of my other classes' labs. And by, by the same token, people from all those other classes are invited to come to this lab, to your lab. So if you see some strangers in lab, you know, they're probably from one, one of my other courses. That sort of automatically extends my office hours. All right, that automatically gives me uh, some extra time uh, to address problems and gives you extra time to address those problems. All right, in addition to that, uh, we can arrange phone conversations. If you can't make it on campus and, you, you know, during any of the times that I'm available, you can uh, arrange a phone conversation or you can arrange a Skype conversation. All right? Uh, typically, it's best to schedule those just like you would schedule an in-person meeting. So let me know if you want to meet with me on Skype or, or over the phone. All right? We could even have an online chat if you, if you wanted uh, you know, if that was, was better for you. The final sort of wild card is that you can come in to, uh, you, we, can, we can talk and we can schedule a time that I'm not normally on campus. All right? So, for example, I'm not normally on campus on Fridays, but that's literally the only time that you can meet. We can schedule a time to meet sometime on Fridays. All right? You can also email me. A lot of problems can be solved via email, and you can either email me through my regular LC email address, or you can email me through Canvas. The preferred way to email me is to email me through Canvas. I get a lot of emails to my regular LC account, and a lot of them aren't terribly relevant to me. You know, someone will CC me on the hours of gym is open or whatever. You know, and student emails. Uh, you know, there's, there's always a risk that that will get lost in the shuffle. Or I might not look at that email quite as often as I look at the emails in Canvas. So your best bet is to email me in Canvas. You can call and leave a phone message, but I would suggest that that's probably a less effective way because I only check my email uh, or voicemail messages periodically, like when I'm on campus, where I check my uh, email messages pretty regularly, typically daily. You're welcome if you send me an email and you don't hear from me for a couple days to send me a reminder because, you know, although I strive to get quick responses to the emails, again, I'm not perfect and I might, something might slip through the cracks. And I might have intended to respond, but then I got an interruption and I never finished. I didn't hit the send button or something like that. All right, so by all means, uh, the bottom line is if, if you want to get a hold of me, I've tried to give you a bunch of options that you can use to get a hold of me. All right? In addition, you can ask me questions in class. Always feel free to ask me questions in class. The worst case scenario, if I don't think it's relevant to discuss in class, because on occasion students will have questions that maybe deal specifically with their homework assignment. You know, not a general question, but a question about something they're doing in their lab and they're not sure what they're doing wrong. That's fine, and I might tell you, okay, let's talk about it in lab. All right? So even if you ask a question that I don't think is relevant to the entire class, there's no harm to ask it. If I don't think it's relevant for the entire class, I'll just say, well, we'll talk about it uh, individually in lab. All right. I think that covers the top part of the syllabus. This is through here. These, this is the course description and outcome. It's important to keep these sort of in the back of your head because really everything we do in this class should relate to these things. And if it doesn't, then we should probably talk about it. We should understand why we're doing something. All right? I don't want you to merely, like, learn what we're doing, but to learn why that we're doing something. Why is it important that we can do this, that, or the other? All right? So keep these requirements and outcomes and the description in the back of your mind. There's no text for this class. Again, good and bad thing. You know, it saves you money, for sure, especially with how, how costly certain textbooks are. But the reliance then is to rely on the materials that I provide and to seek out materials of your own through Safari Books Online or through your own searching and so on. Uh, that's good, but again, if you see something and you're not sure if it's particularly relevant to what you're running into, 
uh, by all means ask, and I'll help point you in the right direction. This is your class. I should probably, you know, this summarizes that whole section. And I know at this point a lot of people say, well, if it's my class, I'm going to cancel the rest of the week. No, it doesn't. Not, not that way. All right. Is your class as far as the coverage of the material goes? It doesn't do me any good if I, quote, cover the material, but no one absorbs it. Uh, or people in the class don't absorb it, even if it's not everyone, even if a few people don't absorb it, or even if one person doesn't absorb it. It doesn't do me any good to say, hey, I can check that off my list. I covered that, right? Because I really didn't. I talked about it, but I didn't really cover it to the point where everyone knows it and understands it. So again, if you're not sure about something, ask. Ask sooner rather than later. All right? Uh, one thing I do, especially in lab, is if sometimes people ask me a question, I may try to hint to get them moving in the right direction. All right? I think that's legitimate. You know, I don't think, uh, I don't think I always have to give you the answer outright. Like, why am I getting this there? Um, I might not say you misspelled gross pay. I might say something like, remember that your variable names are case sensitive. All right? That's a hint. All right? That, oh, maybe, maybe the case of the letters is wrong or something like that. So I do feel that that's part of being a good teacher is not necessarily answering the question outright, but providing the students with some guidance as far as how they can figure it out uh, for themselves. There's a whole set of college policies here, and I refer to the catalog in them. Uh, if you are a special needs student, uh, academic dishonesty, privacy, code of conduct, and so on. So if you want more information on them, I would suggest you look in the college catalog. They're relevant to this and, and all your classes. The FERPA one is really interesting because, you know, I can't, actually cannot give you a reference for a job unless you sign a waiver saying it's okay. So a lot of students, especially students that are graduating or near graduating, will come up to me and say, well, you know, we'd be my, we'd be a reference for me. And usually I'm glad to say, yeah, sure. But you got to go and fill out a form simply because um, it is uh, it's federal law. I wouldn't think there are any college credit plus students in here. Is that correct? Or are there any college, like high school students that are taking this course? Okay. It's interesting, too, and that's where you really get into some good arguments because sometimes parents will want to talk about their students' work in class. And, and according to the law, I'm not, I'm not allowed to unless the student signs a form saying you're allowed to talk to my mom or dad about that. So, all right, but again, since there's no one that fits that, that's something I won't have to worry about, at least not in this class. Late work. I tried my best to write this, but students still sometimes misunderstand it a little bit. The point of this is, at least compared to other instructors, I think I'm very lenient as far as late work goes. I know sometimes that life gets in the way, right? You may have personal situations, you know, an illness in the family or an illness of yourself, or you might have work responsibilities or whatever. You know, I understand that. That's one of the things that's a fact of life, especially at a community college. I mean, it's like that anywhere, but at a community college, people tend to have a little bit more responsibility. Students often work. Uh, sometimes students have families to take care of and so on. So I try to be aware of that and sensitive to that. Uh, and therefore, for me to be a stickler and say, nope, it says 11.59, it's due. You turn it in at 11.59 in eight seconds. Sorry, you're late. You know, I'm not going to do that, you know. Um, for the most part, I just like to be kept in the loop. So if you had extra work responsibilities this week, so you might be a day late on an assignment, for example, you don't even have to tell me exactly, well, we're doing inventory and I had to work, you know, a 12-hour shift and blah, 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 blah. You don't even have to go into great details if you don't want to. Just say, I had, you know, work was very hectic this week. Uh, I'm going to I'm going to turn it in tomorrow instead of today, and we'll be cool if that's the case. And and remind me when you turn it in, but you don't really uh, need to worry about that. You know, you won't have points deducted. Or a 
especially with personal situations. You, know, you don't have to tell me your business. You know, if you have a family situation, you don't have to go into details. Just say, you know, I've, I've, I've been dealing with some personal issues this week. You know, here's, you know, uh, I won't be able to get it in until the weekend. And, you know, I'm going to be fine with that. What I don't like is people that simply disappear. I don't hear anything from them, and then eight weeks in the semester, they're turning in lab two or three or four, you know. Um, so just keep me in the loop if there's a problem. Now, the one thing I will say... Oh, hi. <laughs> the one thing I will say is that uh, if you are late on an ongoing basis, that that's a sign that something has to change, right? Maybe you need to talk to me to understand the material, all right, uh, better. Uh, maybe you need to spend more hours working on the homework assignment or whatever, all right? So you're late once or twice, no big deal, you know? I'm interested in, in what you learn by the end of the semester. If you're two days late, understanding validation controls, I'm okay with that, all right? But, no matter how flexible I am, by the end of the semester, everything is due, right? So therefore, if you are falling behind continuously, it's gonna probably snowball, and you might get later and later. So, if you're late a few assignments in a row, then we need to talk, and we'll work together to figure it out. I've had some great cases and great examples of students that have talked to me and they just were having trouble with the material. Some of you are taking a couple of classes with me, right? In which case, my condolences, all right? And besides that, uh, sometimes it gets confusing. Gee, we're covering JavaScript in this class and we're covering ASP in this class. I, I understand that. You know, I when I took programming classes a long time ago, I dealt with that situation too. So I, I, can, I can understand that, all right? Um, but there's been cases where students have approached me and said, look, I'm just not getting this. And we came up with a plan that the student came in like during another class's lab once a week until they got caught up or something like that. And there's been some great success stories of students have started off really, really struggling and by the, by the end of the semester they were doing just a great job in the class. So I encourage you to just talk to me. We'll figure something out. There's a lot of things we can do, but I have to be aware that there is a situation and I have to understand, uh, and we have to talk about it so I can understand what sort of help to offer you, right? And if people just disappear and don't keep me in the loop, then I, I don't know what to think. I don't know if, if the student simply has given up on the course and they're planning to drop it or whatever. All right, so just keep me in the loop is, is all I ask. One additional note I would like to say is when you turn in an assignment, I assume the assignment is to the best of your ability complete. So when you turn it in, I, you know, you should be thinking, yes, this is a completed assignment. If you know that there's a problem with it, don't turn it in. Email it to me and say, I'm 80% done, but I can't get this part to work. All right? Because the way it works is I grade things periodically, once a week, whatever. I check my email daily. So if something was due today, for example, and you were not correct with it, all right, um, I might not grade it until a week from today, all right, in which case all that time has gone on without me giving you an answer. Whereas if you were to email me today and say, hey, I got this program mostly working, but this one thing isn't working, you'll get an answer probably that day. So don't turn something in unless, to the best of your knowledge, it's correct. One thing I do frequently is I give you the opportunity to rework assignments. Um, people always say you learn from your mistakes, all right? Um, that's only partly true, right? Uh, if, if you learn from your mistakes, then the Browns will probably go 16-0 this year, right? Because they made enough mistakes that they should be experts at everything. And, and I doubt that's going to be the case, you know, maybe 15-1 and one at best, right? Um, but you learn from your mistakes if you go back and think about them and figure out what you did wrong and then take steps to correct it. So therefore, if you turn something in, if it doesn't work, or if it works somewhat, but there's a bug in it or whatever, a lot of times I will give you, you know, 
instead of five points, I would give you four points, and I'll say you can resubmit if, if you want. All right? You don't have to. Who's wrong? And figure it out. Now, that being said, a lot of times I won't necessarily be real specific, like, hey, you forgot to put a semicolon here or something like that. I will give you, again, a hint to say your calculation wasn't correct. All right? In which case, go and double check the calculations. And again, if you don't know what I mean, you can always ask, and I'll, I'll clarify it. But since I'm giving you credit to figure out what you did wrong, I don't feel obligated to tell you precisely what you did wrong. So all you have to go is all you have to do is go into the program and type it in. All right? Okay. Um, your program will be your your your, um, your grade will be based on uh, this coursework. 30% for your project, 70 points for your assignments. So there's no tests or quizzes in this, no final and whatever. You have a project instead of a final. Um, your project is done in two pieces. There's a design phase and the final version of the project. And then your homework, they'll more or less be weekly assignments. And it should add up to 70 points. Every once in a while, it doesn't add up exactly to 70 points. It might add up to 68 points or 75 points or whatever, in which case I prorate it. I multiply it by whatever the appropriate fraction is and turn it into 70 points for your homework and then add your project grade. I urge you to read everything because I just, I emphasize the stuff I want to emphasize, but that doesn't mean that I covered everything. So please go and read um, read the entire syllabus and bring any questions you have. I do want to show you that there is a module for your project. Ten points for the design, twenty points for the completed, and there's instructions for it. Um, we'll go over this in class, not today. But it's probably a good idea if you read the instructions um, as soon as you can, just to get an idea of what you're going to be required to do. Even if you don't know how to do it yet, at least get an idea of what. And may, maybe start thinking about something that you're interested in. Because your project, you get to pick what, what you do. All right. Questions about anything? One thing I've learned in my years of teaching is students hate when their instructor asks them to introduce yourself and give a fun fact about yourself. So I never do that. All right. So you can thank my previous classes plus what I've read on the internet for me not, not doing that. All right. Okay. So that is the overview of the way the course is structured on Canvas. What I want to do now is I want to talk about really what we're going to do in this class on a very high level. And I'm going to assume that you all have taken CISS 216. That is the intro to web development. Is that accurate? So you've all developed HTML pages. Okay. All right. So in CISS 216, we created web pages. If we were going to make those web pages live, all right, so let's say you finished your final project and you said, well, that's a great project. I want to actually make that a real website. There's a few things that you'd have to do. You'd have your web pages. You'd have to put them out somewhere on a web server. People, other instructors must write a lot harder than I do. Because these tips are like obliterated every time. Oh, well, we'll try this. So what's a web server?
If you had to define a web server, what does a web server do? It serves content to clients. Yeah, it serves content to clients. All right. You get the sense of server meaning it delivers something. You know, your server in a restaurant delivers food. All right. In the case of a web server, it delivers content to a client. All right. In a lot of different uh, contexts, there are clients and servers. A web server specifically is connected to the web. which I draw as a cloud. I realize it's not original, but I swear I've been doing that for years, even before the phrase cloud computing. And it supplies content to a client. What, what is a client in this situation? User. A user. Someone sitting at their laptop surfing the web. All right? So a typical transaction might be you open up your web browser, so the client is a human being, typically running some sort of browser that might type in the address bar, give me www.google.com, or maybe we'll click a link on the page, give me this page or whatever, and they make a request to a web server, okay? So client makes a request. That request travels through the internet. We draw it as a cloud because we don't know exactly the path it takes. It gets to the right web server. It's sort of like if you mail a letter, right? If you mail a letter and you put my address on it, you know, let's say you mail it from Florida, well, it might get picked up by the Florida mailman, and the mailman might take it to the Florida post office, and it might get sent to Atlanta, and then from Atlanta to Columbus, and Columbus to Cleveland, and then Cleveland to my office here at LC. So it follows a path. For the purpose of this class, we don't care what that path is. It somehow makes it to the web server. Your networking class, you probably care about how it makes it there. Right? But this class, we don't care. We just know that if a request is made, it gets sent to the web server. So in a very general sense, a client is someone that makes a request. All right? So when we could talk about database servers. A client in a database server makes requests to a database server. A client to a web server makes requests to a web server. A file server, a client makes requests for a file, and so on. So clients always make requests to someone for something. In the case of web servers, they make requests for web pages. All right? So the client has to be connected to the internet, and the web server has to be connected to the internet. All right? And there's all kinds of things that you may or may not have studied about the HTTP protocol and IP addresses and all that sort of stuff that we're not really going to focus on. Every machine on the internet has an IP address. Uh, there are domain name servers that connect the www.google.com to the specific IP address and all that sort of stuff. And if you set up your website, that's one thing that you'd have to do is you have to register your domain point it to the IP address, and then, then this routing would work, and you would get your requests. All right? The web server then provides a response. Now, I pick these two words carefully, all right? Because that's usually, that's specifically what, what, they're referred to is the request and the response. All right, there might be synonyms for request and response, question and answer, or whatever, but we don't use those. We say request and response. Now, the response from a web server is going to be what? It's going to be a web page. All right. What does web? What do web pages consist of, language-wise? Well, they consist of HTML, 
CSS, and maybe JavaScript. Typically, most modern web pages are going to consist of all of these, sort of a mix. Each one of these things has a certain role. The HTML is the content of the page. So all the text, the images, the links, and so on. <coughs> the CSS is the formatting and the appearance of the page. The, the background is yellow and the text is blue, whatever. The JavaScript is a behavior of the page. Well, um, your image gallery changes every 15 seconds or something like that. That would typically be something that would be done in JavaScript. These are the languages that the browser understands. All right. I should rephrase that. These are the languages that the client understands. The client might not be a browser. All right. Can anyone think of a case where the client, something we're asking for a web page, might not be a person sitting at a web browser? A little bit tricky of a question, because usually that's what we think of when we think of a client for a web server. Any thoughts? Query. Pardon me? Query. A query, a query is just sort of a, uh, a different sort of request. So that's still probably going to be someone uh, at a browser. Yes? Another computer. Another computer, right, because our person was the a machine. So when would another machine be asking for a web page? It's one classic case of that. Google indexing its search index, right? I don't know how the magic works. That's why they're billionaires and I'm not, right? But somehow, there's some machine running some program that's out there looking for stuff, and it creates an index, all right? So there's not a person that's going to say, ooh, Here's a new website. Let me go add it to the search index, right? I mean, that's you know, ridiculous. So there's a program that's running. So we have to be very open when we think about client, because normally we think of someone sitting at a computer, but could be someone sitting at a computer, could be someone sitting at a laptop, could be someone with a gaming console, could be someone with a mobile device, all right? So the one thing that all clients have in common, though, is that they make requests. All right? So that Google bot that's going out and searching the internet to create an index is making a request, just as me sitting down and typing, <coughs> typing information uh, at, the, uh, uh, at the keyboard, typing in the address bar that I want google.com or lionccc.edu or whatever is making a request. So the response typically is going to come back in the form of a web page. And a web page typically consists of HTML, CSS, and JavaScript. Okay. So, so far, so good. Back to CISS 216. In CISS 216, we made HTML pages that had CSS and maybe a little bit of JavaScript. If you were to go, let's say you took CISS 216 in the spring, okay? If you were to go and open up the first web page you created on January whatever of this year and looked at it, it would look identical to the day that you turned it in. Right? If you looked at your final project, it would look identical to the day that you turned it in. It's unchanging. All right? When we talk about something that is unchanging, that's referred to as being static. All right? So, the kinds of web pages that we did in CISS 216 were static web pages. And what are static pages? They're pages that are written in HTML, CSS, and JavaScript that are, live on a web server. And when a client asks for a static page, the web server simply goes out, finds the page on disk, and delivers it without any processing to the client. 
So the thing about a client web server is it's already made. It's pre-made. And it's sitting out there. All right? So if, again, if you thought of your project that you turned in, it's not going to change unless you manually went in and changed the code. All right? It's the only way to change a static web page is to manually go in and edit the HTML code. But if you didn't touch that code, everything is going to look identical to the day that you turned it in. Now, when the web was first created, that's what all web pages were, were static pages. And it was great, right? Because people could put their articles and other stuff, scientific articles and information and all that kind of stuff out there. And any computer that was connected to the internet that was running a web browser could access it. And it was great. However, most of what we expect in websites today go far beyond static web pages. All right? They are the realm of dynamic web pages. Dynamic means that the content of the web page changes without someone manually going in and changing it. Can anyone think of an example of a dynamic page? So, pardon me? Amazon's homepage. Amazon's page. Why is that dynamic? Because it's based off your search. And right. Exactly. So, for example, if both of us were to log on to Amazon, right, me and anyone else in the class, and we looked at the page, they wouldn't be identical, right? You would have recommendations for products like the products that you bought before. I would have recommendations for products like I bought before, all right? It always used to drive me crazy back when I would buy gifts like Christmas gifts for my daughter. So like, I, you know, I like jazz music, so I might buy a Miles Davis record or Thelonious Monk or something. And for them, I was buying, you know, Backstreet Boys and NSYNC. So I'd see all these recommendations. Like, you could tell, like, you know, there would be a Duke Ellington record and then a, you know, the new NSYNC record or a Justin Timberlake solo album or something like that. So it always took a while for me to, like, order up stuff to, like, clear out my recommendations from that and get to the new stuff. But the point is, is my recommendations are going to be based off of what, I, what my purchase history is. Your recommendations are going to be based on what your purchase history is. So the content that we see is going to be different depending on who we are how we have logged in, all right? And just to be, make, make an obvious point, I think it's an obvious point, it's not like there's a programmer at Amazon custom writing an HTML page for me. Oh, look, Mike logged on. Hmm, let me go and change the page to recommend his stuff, right? There is a program that does that. There is code that goes and looks at your purchase history and comes up with recommendations. All right? So we'll fill in, you know, static pages are made of those things. We'll fill in what dynamic pages are in a minute here. What are, what's another example of a dynamic web page? Facebook. Facebook, absolutely. Your timeline's gonna look different than mine. Your timeline's gonna have a list of your friends and what they posted, and my timeline's gonna have a list of my friends and what they posted. In addition, if you come back later today, you're going to see new posts that people have posted since, like, you checked this morning, all right? Did someone go and change the web page for you? You know, ooh, Mark posted something new to Facebook. I better go and edit all of Mark's friends' timeline. It, it, it's absurd to even think of that, right? You couldn't possibly do that. You couldn't possibly have a static HTML page sitting out there that got edited every time some update was made. All right? Instead, we have programs, or what are called server-side scripts. That do that. It's almost hard to think of pages that are completely static. 
because we've come to expect like more functionality from websites than simply being like an electronic brochure like they were in the early days, right? We expect interactivity. We expect customization, you know? So like any, you know, if you were to name the top websites that people visit, they're all going to be dynamic, all right? Google's dynamic, of course, right? They don't have a page for every possible thing that you could search for. Your request tells them what you're going to search for, and then they prepare that page for you custom. Facebook, uh, Amazon, eBay, right? Someone bids on an item. Is there a programmer that's updating the HTML? No. All right? Of course not. So how do these dynamic pages work? Well, they have server-side scripts, which are programs. Frequently, these scripts involve interacting with the database. A better way to say that is they interact with a database server. So really, the web server is actually a client to the database server. Um, because the web server is making requests for data, the database server is providing it. All right. So if I log into Facebook, I put in my credentials, my username and ID. Uh, there's a program that will go and look, find all my friends, find all their posts, figures out the most relevant ones, right? Because you don't see everyone's posts, right? You see posts that it thinks you it want you, that you want to see, right? Based on likes and people that you, you know, that you interact with more and all that. And it comes up with an HTML page that gets delivered to you. Now here's what's interesting. Doesn't matter if it's static or dynamic. What gets delivered back to the client is an HTML page, a page that consists of HTML, CSS, and JavaScript. The only difference is, is in the case of static web pages, that web page is pre-written. All the server has to do is grab it and send it to you. Oh, you want this restaurant's menu. Okay, that's static. We don't change the menu very often. Boom, here it is. Get sent to you. Versus, I've logged into Facebook. Well, let me run the program that looks at the database and comes up with the stuff that's on your timeline. And then creates an HTML page for that. And then that gets sent to you. Now here's the analogy I always do, and this is especially good now that there's a subway on campus. Now I don't get you know, I don't get an endorsement from Subway, but by the way, if anyone from Subway sees this video and like wants to like give me free sandwiches every day, I'd be glad to wear a little Subway T-shirt. All right, just in case you're out there. All right. When you go to McDonald's and order a Big Mac and fries. All right. For the most part, again, there might be exceptions, but for the most part, there's a bin of Big Macs sitting there. There's a bin of small fries and large fries sitting there. And when you order something, all the server does is reach in the bin, grabs a Big Mac, puts it in your bag, and hands it to you. Especially if you're talking about during the lunchtime rush, those sandwiches are pre-made for you. All right. And the server as the person working behind the counter, doesn't have to do much work. They simply find the completed sandwich that you asked for in the bin and give it to you. All right? That's like a static web page. Subway is like a dynamic web page, right? Why? Because you make a request. All right? And you give them input, right? Because even if both of us order a turkey sandwich, may end up with two totally different things, right? I might want a turkey sandwich on wheat bread with provolone, not toasted, and mayonnaise. You might want one on white bread with Swiss cheese, toasted, and, uh, I don't know, other vegetables, all right? So it's customized to exactly what we request. So the difference here is, is what the request has. 
The request tells the server specifically what we want. So, the request will at least be the URL of the page that we want. We might also include some parameters. Now, in the case of Subway, it might be the kind of bread, what sandwich we want, the vegetables, the cheese, toasted or not, and so on down the line. In Google, the parameters we give might be, what is it we're searching for? All right? In Facebook, the parameters might be our credentials, our login and password. All right? Same thing in Canvas. Our Canvas pages are dynamic, right? Because they look different. All right? So, the web server then has a tougher job with these dynamic pages because the web page or the web server has to take all these parameters that were supplied by the user, typically through a form, right? On a web page. On a web page, you go to Google, there's a box for you to type in what you want. Um, on Facebook, username and password uh, for you to type in. On Canvas, same thing. So, the web server takes those parameters that were supplied as part of the request, runs the program, pulls from the database, and performs its magic and creates a custom HTML page just for that request. Just like at Subway, your turkey sandwich is made for you, all right, to your request. My turkey sandwich is made just for me. It's not like they have a bin of every possible sandwich there. You know, here's turkey with onions, here's turkey without onions, here's turkey with Swiss and onions, turkey Swiss and not onions. The number of combinations would be absurd of how many sandwiches they would have to have. Just like if Google tried to use static pages, the number of static pages would be absurd. You know, you couldn't even, couldn't even count how many possibilities of things that you could search for would be. So you don't create individual ones. You create a program that can take the input, along with data from a database, smash it all together, let the program do its thing, read the database, and create a custom HTML page for everyone that logs on, all right, to Canvas, or everyone that logs on to Facebook, or everyone that does a Google search, all right? Here's the key thing. People eat sandwiches for lunch. So it doesn't matter if you go to Subway or go to McDonald's, you're getting a sandwich, all right? Web pages or, or web browsers consume web pages. So it doesn't matter if it's static or dynamic, what gets delivered to the client is going to be an HTML page. It may have been pre-written, or it may have been created right then by the web server. And if you think about it, that's amazing, right? Every time you search in Google, there's a search engine somewhere that is reading through some massive database and looking at all kinds of parameters to come up with a page just for you. Now, interestingly enough, there's more than just what you type in the form that gets sent to the server along with the request. There's other parameters besides what you've typed in on the form. Can we think of an example of something that the web server uses, let's say in a Google search, um, that isn't typed in the form? Location. Location, absolutely. Let's, look, let's, let's do some Googling here. Type in Italian restaurants, let's say. All right, let's notice something. 
all these restaurants are pretty close to where we are, right? Garden at the Midway Mall. Nino's in North Ridgeville. Best in Loring County. And so on. Now there's two possibilities. Two possibilities. Either all the best Italian restaurants are in Loring County, <laughs> worldwide, or the Google algorithm, the Google script that produces this page knows where we're at. All right? Well, clearly, the second one is, is the correct answer, right? If, you know, my brother in New York, if he Googled, he would get a list of Italian restaurants in New York. If you were in California, you'd get a list over there. If you were in Italy, you would get a different list and so on. All right? So, that's another thing. I didn't type in that I was in Lorain County, yet somehow the server knew that. How it knows it? Well, it looks at your IP address. Your IP address, it can figure out an approximate location. It's not like GPS location, but it's approximate. So it kind of knows that we're in Northern Ohio. All right? So it doesn't know we're sitting in a classroom at Lorain County Community College, but it knows that we're in the Elyria area. All right? Um, Anything else other than location that a search engine would use, for example? Yes? Uh, your previous uh, visited websites? Your previous visited websites. That's an interesting thing, and that's, that, that actually has political implications, right? Someone that has one set of political uh, views, if they Google something, gets a different result than people that have a person that has different political views all right so you tend to get more of what you've already seen which I don't know is interesting is that a good thing I don't know this isn't a sociology class though so we won't discuss that we're just going to discuss the technology involved all right that yes what you searched for in the past has a bearing of what results you're going to see anything else yes How new the content is, so based on the date and time. Uh, other things I could think of, the platform that you're on, whether you're on Windows or Mac. If I was on a Mac and did a search for a certain software, I might get the download for Mac. If I was on a Windows, I might get download for Windows links. Mobile device versus a, uh, a, a desktop, I might get different results. All these things are parameters that get sent to the server that can be used to customize the output. All right, now, I mentioned that sort of this magic happens through the use of server-side scripts. There's a bunch of server-side scripting technology, and we're going to talk about one of them in this class. All right? We're going to talk about ASP.NET plus C sharp. Alright? That's what we're using in this class. ASP.NET is a framework, C sharp is a programming language. We'll talk a little bit more about that next time. But this is a technology that we're using. This is a set of server-side scripting or server-side technologies that we're using. We'll be another example of a language or technology that's used to create web pages, dynamic web pages. Is uh, Azure one of them? Uh, I don't believe so. Yeah, I guess my question was like when downloading Visual Studio, mm -hmm. which boxes to check to make sure right. that we had the right stuff. I guess. Right. You would want to, you'd want to, to create websites and uh, you would want uh, C Sharp downloaded. I'm not sure what all the questions are, but we'll show what we're going to create in a minute here. Examples I'm thinking of is PHP, Python, JSP, Java servlet pages, or Java server pages, Java servlets, 
Ruby on Rails. So server-side scripting is, is a generic term. It's like saying automobile. Where these are specific like makes of automobile. So this is a way, this is a kind of server-side script, this is a kind of server-side script, and so on. All of these do the same basic thing. But, you know, just like a, you know, Ford Escort and a Rolls-Royce are both automobiles, how they do the specific thing that they do is what, what changes, right, is what, what matters. We're going to be talking about this. And we'll talk a little bit more about what these things are, because... I want, I want to make sure we use the correct terminology in this class for things, but we will pick up on that next time. What I would like to do is look at assignment one and talk about how I want you to do it. And you can do this in lab. You can do this in on your own machine if you have Visual Studio installed. I swear earlier today I thought I was going to get hit by lightning because I heard it. It was so loud. <laughs> it's like, oh my goodness. And it's like it, it, it's quiet and then it just like comes down like someone turned the tap on, you know, really loud. Okay, so your first assignment is to create, and I do this in several of my classes. So I've created a web page that sort of preview, previews the technologies that we're going to use. So I want you to create a web page, so you just have to create one web page, you don't have to create three web pages, but create a web page that gives an overview of the main topics of this course. The main topics of this course are ASP.NET, database design, and SQL. For each of these topics, you should, before you begin creating the page, you should search the internet to find information, resources, Four links about each topic, and then it might be useful to sketch it out. What do you, how you want it to look? Like just take a sheet of paper and draw out how you want it to look. I then want you to, using Visual Studio, create an ASP web application that contains a page with the above information. Your page should look professional, and your web page should contain for each topic a description that you write, references and resources. References are pages where like you get definitions of terms, where resources are pages that show you how to do something. I really don't care as long as you have four links. All right. So you're going to research these topics, find out what they are, find out like pages that like are tutorials, let's say. And then you're going to create an ASP web app. How do you do that? Well, I'm going to go to Visual Studio. I'm going to go up to File, New. I'm then going to pick that I want an ASP.NET Web Applications.NET Framework. Here's all your other options, but that's the one we're going to pick. And I want to use C Sharp. So ASP Web Application C Sharp. I can put it anywhere I want. So I can put it on the desktop if I want. And 
and I can call it example. I can pick the version of the framework that I want. Typically, you would just go with the defaults. I'm going to click OK. I'm going to pick Web Forms. Then I'm going to click OK. It's doing its thing. created sort of a little mini website for me. Um, we'll do this for this assignment. For future assignments, we'll create a blank website. So, I will go and Solution Explorer, pick default ASPX, and then you can edit, edit the web page. So this created a web page for you. I actually wanted to create an empty web page, so I clicked on something wrong. Uh, in lab, if you want to experiment with it to create an empty web page, you're welcome to. Or you can do it this way. You can view the page either in HTML mode or design mode. So what I want you to do is go in and add content to this page. Actually, let me, let me try. Let me go in and create an empty one. So scratch that. So. Empty. That's what I want. I'm sorry, not web forms, but empty. Then click OK. Now if you notice, it doesn't create any pages for you because we want to create it from scratch. So I'll go to File, New, File, and create a web form. HTML page. <coughs> this 
is substantially different than what I've seen before. There should be a web form option, but HTML page, OK. And then you can create, within Visual Studio, you can create the HTML. You can either, uh, that you want to contain that information. This is annoying, because it's a lot different than what I had seen before. To test it, you would just go and Click, run, and it will go and pull up this page. So you can do the research. We'll talk more about this next time. There will be our page eventually. I want to see. Uh, How about this? For this first assignment, don't worry about using Visual Studio, because obviously the version that we have uh, here um, is different enough from the previous version that I'm very confused at this point. So uh, just create a regular HTML file any way that you want to. You can use Visual Studio if you want, but you don't have to. You can just use Notepad++ or whatever. But again, so, so I will alter the assignment to reflect the new uh, the new specifications, but still has to be on those topics, okay? Uh, by next time, I will review uh, the functionality of this and we'll be in a better position to show you exactly how you want to create pages. All right. We'll see.